Welcome to this fireside chat uh, about all things Spectrum. Uh, my name is Peter Sherman. I'm Head of Innovation for Cisco UKNI and the Project Director for 5G Thinking, uh, and I'll be chairing this conversation. Um, we have with us uh, three guests who, uh, who are far more knowledgeable uh, uh, about this to me. Uh, in fact, I will, I will admit to camera uh, that Spectrum has been one of those topics where I've never quite managed to get my head all the way around it, despite working in telecoms policy for 15 years uh, and in 5G for the last four. Um, now, that is probably not an uncommon feeling uh, for many who are looking at uh, how to make use of uh, a spectrum for, for their own local community networks. Uh, so this is in part uh, uh, an opportunity for us to help to demystify uh, uh, some, of, uh, some of the issues around it uh, and some of the more useful tools and, uh, and, and systems and processes that we, we know of uh, in order to, to help communities uh, on, on their, 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 their local 5G journey. Um, so, uh, if I can uh, come to, to each of you uh, and uh, just ask you to give a quick introduction, um, who you are, uh, who you're representing, and, and what you've been doing in the project, uh, that'd be great. Uh, I'll start with you, Kenny. Hi, uh, so my name's Kenny Barley. I'm a researcher at Strathclyde, Strath SDR, um, and I've been heavily involved in the design of the 4G, 5G network up in Orkney. So I've been carrying out a lot of the sort of RF network design, all the simulations, and figuring out where best to place the masts. Uh, and Bob, come to you next. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Bob Stewart. So I'm an academic, a professor at the University of Strathclyde, and I lead a team there, uh, Strath SDR, SDR being all about software-defined radio, which is really the technology driving a lot of modern networks. So I was the, the lead in this uh, 5G New Thinking project at Strathclyde. Uh, and uh, last but definitely not least, Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Neal with Federated Wireless. So Federated uh, makes the Spectrum Access System in, in the U.S. for managing access to the CDRS band. Uh, in this project, I was Federated's uh, technical lead on creating a number of tools that would help streamline and simplify access to, uh, to shared bands, uh, particularly the, the local access licenses and the shared access licenses. Brilliant. And we are going to get to an explainer of what both of those terms mean in due course. Uh, uh, not at least because I really should know. Uh, so uh, let me uh, let me start with a with a with a with a, with a, with a basic question. Um, uh, uh, Bob, tell us uh, uh, as the the premier academic in the room, uh, what is Spectrum? Uh, what's the deal with it? Why why does it matter? Okay, so uh, as short as I can. So Spectrum, you know, it's an electromagnetic wave, as is light, X-ray, uh, ultraviolet, and so on, and it's a particular band that we can use for communications. And for many people, uh, spectrum is an everyday occurrence, whether it's the mobile network devices, or of course, FM radio, DAB radio, TV, everything is broadcast over this spectrum. And in many ways, uh, we can numerically section this up and we'll talk about hundreds of megahertz and gigahertz, and that's our language of which particular band. And although most people will not necessarily be familiar with that, you're probably familiar with FM radio and your favorite station is 102.5. Well, that's 102.5 megahertz or 106.5, 106.5 megahertz. And that's the frequency band. And essentially all the way up to uh, you know, a few gigahertz in this particular project, these bands are what we use for our communication. But like many things, uh, it has to be uh, policed or managed in some way. So you cannot just start broadcasting on uh, spectrum bands or you will interfere. So just like the local radio station, if you started to broadcast there, you will interfere. So spectrum is this kind of electromagnetic wave that we will be using uh, for communications. It plays all of the laws uh, of you know, physics and speed of light and so on. But we don't really need to worry about that in this uh, type of project. We know what it is and we know we can use it. Super. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and uh, uh, so, tell me, um, who, who, uh, just a follow up, Bob, who would be the the licensees? Who who owns that the, the spectrum that we're talking about here? Okay, so I'll say a couple of things, and very appropriate, I think, for colleagues to say. But uh, for FM radio, for example, again, something I think most people can uh, can uh, uh, relate to. Obviously, you have to be given uh, or or buy or acquire a license uh, from from Ofcom in order to be allowed to use that frequency in a certain geography. And then moving up what we call the, the spectrum to digital audio broadcast, well, same again, BBC are there, local radio stations are there. And then moving to 
what we'll call mobile network operator and wireless spectrum. Everyone will be familiar with Wi-Fi, uh, which we use in homes and offices. And Wi-Fi is a special unlicensed, which means you can use it if you play by the rules. But other bands, particularly some we'll talk about later from mobile network operators, clearly they, 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 are, they, they have acquired these licenses via auctions. They have paid money for the privilege to use these bands. So that's something, again, a little bit different to unlicensed or to the kind of one-way broadcast of TV uh, or radio. And uh, Kenny, if I could bring you in here, how, does that, how has that affected your radio planning uh, uh, that you've been doing up in Orkney? What, what, what does that mean for you? So the network we've been designing up in Orkney, or designed and ran during our testbed, um, was using a mixture of 4G and 5G radios. And when you're designing a radio network, you can, you can transmit in whatever frequency uh, your, your radio transmitters operate at. One of the things you need to consider is what uh, the receive side is capable of doing. Now, because we're doing 4G, 5G, that means we're using uh, 4G, 5G modems, and smartphones, et cetera. And they only work in a limited subset of the radio bands. So we've been basically tied to the, the sort of traditional mobile network bands, and you can't really stray outside of that because there's not an, an ecosystem of equipment. So the, the radios that we've deployed um, operate in these standard mobile network bands. So as Bob mentioned, you know, 102.5 megahertz for FM radio. We're talking 700 megahertz for, uh, for some of the 5G bands we're using, 1800 megahertz, 3,500 gigahertz, uh, megahertz as well. Um, you know, sort of a wide range of different bands. Now, the lower frequency bands, for example, the 700 megahertz, they are able to broadcast over a very long distance. And that's great for rural propagation. You know, if you, if you put a mast up at the top of a hill, you should be able to receive the signal maybe 15 kilometers away or whatever. The higher frequency up in what's called the mid-band spectrum, so around 3.5 gigahertz, um, some of the sort of typical 5G bands, they, they do not propagate as far. So if you put up a 3.5 gigahertz cell, it will maybe cover one or two kilometers. So there's a sort of relationship between the, the coverage you get and the frequency bands. And that's, that's two of the main things you need to play with when you're designing a 4G, 5G network. Super. Thank you, Kenny. Um, and uh, Jerry, if I, can, if I can pick your brain. Um, so if, uh, if this is the spectrum that we need, ideally to do, to do local, uh, uh, these local networks, um, how do we uh, how do we identify whether we're able to use that? And, and you, you, know, you mentioned a couple of license terms uh, earlier. Um, what are our options for, for how we uh, how we access that? Okay. So there, there's a few different options for, for getting access to the spectrum. So um, as as Bob and Kim mentioned, the, the mobile network operators or MNOs have licensed large swaths of spectrum across the entire UK. You can directly approach them and work out some sort of leasing or, or uh, other uh, business arrangement with them. Um, you can also uh, make use of unlicensed bands. We must go and deploy things and maybe that's the Wi-Fi sort of examples that Bob uh, mentioned. Um, but then in, in 2019, Ofcom uh, issued uh, a new framework for allowing access to spectrum for, uh, for operators that tend to be smaller and more heterogeneous and, and, and not as traditional. Uh, and they call these the, the, the local licensing. Frameworks, and so there was two uh, modes within that. One was called local access licensing, and the other was called shared access licensing. So, in local access licensing, they, they defined a, a kind of a, a very loose framework by which you could go and make use of MNO spectrum uh, and deploy your own network. Now, you had to do that in such a way that you wouldn't cause interference, as Bob was highlighting being a bad thing for network operations. You couldn't interfere with them, and you wouldn't want them to interfere with you either. So, you had to go and find places where they weren't operating. Um, there's a number of ways you can go by doing you can go online databases, you can go out to field measurements. Uh, we made a tool that was pulling in uh, information about the, the MNOs reported coverage areas you can then go and evaluate against. And then uh, when folks like Kenny would go through and take measurements, we also uploaded that and that could crowdsource over time. Um, the, after you kind of show technically that you wouldn't interfere, then you had to go through with that and coordinate directly with the MNOs to get them to agree that they're not going to be using the spectrum now and they're not planning to use it in the near future. And if, if they agree to that and Ofcom agree to that, uh, then you can get a license for, for three years. Um, the, 
one of the challenges that's been with local access licenses is one, you have that, uh, so there's a number of challenges with that. One of which is it's only for three years, which makes it hard to build out your network. And two, it's not fundamentally that different from directly engaging with an MO as you have to go and get through approval for the future operations anyways. But it is a framework. Uh, that there's been uh, 18, 20 different applications through that process. Um, the other framework established uh, in, in 2019 is the shared access license. And so what Ofcom did there is they, they set aside a handful of bands. So 1800, uh, 2.3, 3.8 to 4.2 and 26 gigs. Um, those are the, the ranges of spectrum that correspond to those four bands. And they said that you can get access to, to these bands and you don't have to worry about coordinating with an m &O. There's no m &Os in these bands. And we're actually gonna set up the rules such that if you're a traditional nationwide operator, you can't augment your existing nationwide operate, operations as part of these bands. So it's very focused on folks who want to deploy new private networks that are, that are non-traditionals. Um, so, there you, you go through and there's an application process again, and you specify these are the parameters of my network that's going to operate, what's the height, what's the location is going to be on the hill like Kenny was talking about, uh, what, what band do you want to operate in, what transmit power, all these things factor into your coverage and capacity, but also factors into interference analysis that Ofcom has to do to make certain that you're not going to interfere with other operators in that band. And then also a number of systems that predate uh, the cell framework. So there's some earth stations, there's some microwave point to point links, uh, there's some special MOD operations that have to be protected. But Ofcom will go through it and make certain that based off the, the parameters that you put in your application that you won't uh, interfere with them. And then if, if they agree that, that it's uh, operational and wouldn't be uh, interfering, they'll, they'll grant you a one-year license but renewable. So you can continue to operate your network year after year after year, as long as you're staying within the, the uh, prescribed uh, operational parameters that you provided. So, uh, so going back through again, you can uh, directly get a hold of, of spectrum through auction or, or coordinating directly with MNOs. That's option one. Option two, this unlicensed spectrum like Wi Fi, you can get a hold of. There is local access licenses, which are very similar to uh, going ahead and directly negotiating with MNO, and then there's shared access licenses. Uh, I've also pointed you can also get experimental uh, spectrum as well, but that's not for actual business operations or longer term use. Super. Thank you, Jody. And can I just uh, so just picking up on something that, that, that Kenny said earlier? Yeah, you know, we're we're bound by operating within the the, the parameters of, of these bands, uh, partly because of you know, end user equipment availability and, and things like that. Uh, are there any constraints there if we're looking at say a shared access band that an operator wouldn't? beyond uh, because they're, 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 with, they're withheld from it. Yeah, so the main shared access bands that we've got in the UK at the moment are um, 1800 megahertz, uh, 3.8 to 4.2 gigahertz, and uh, some of the millimeter wave bands, plus there's a wee slither at 2300 megahertz. Now, uh, the, the, all these lower ones, the, the, the 1800, the 2300, the 3.5, they all line up with uh, mobile bands. So there's a, a sort of growing ecosystem of equipment available there. The 3.8 to 4.2 in particular, there is a lot of spectrum available there. There's 400 megahertz available for deploying 5G networks. So if you uh, were to roll out the, the fanciest 5G network you can build right now with the biggest bandwidths out of your radios, you could have uh, 400 megahertz carriers existing in that band. So you know, that could deliver multi gigabit per second off that mast. Um, there is an ecosystem growing for uh, the 5G radios um, for that band and for the for example, the, the 5G fixed wireless access CPEs or whatever you're going to connect to that uh, network. Um, the likes of the 1800 megahertz band, there's a, a sort of more mature ecosystem because that's one of the, the bands that's been around since the days of 2G. So tell me about, uh, uh, about getting access uh, and going through that process with Ofcom. Uh, what's, uh, uh, what have we learned about that, uh, about that process from, from what we've done with new thinking? I'll, I'll pick someone. Sorry, I should pick someone. Um, uh, um, Jody, is that a, something you can apply on? Sure, I'll, I'll answer that a little bit. I'm not directly applying for licenses. So can you give you firsthand uh, uh, experiences with that? But, but we've supported a number of applications. So um, on, on the local access licenses, um, the, it's, it's absolutely critical that you coordinate with the MMOs ahead of time. Uh, Ofcom can, can uh, perform the same analysis that our tool does. It says you shouldn't interfere. But what's not known is what are the future MMOs plans in that band? 
and that's not something they, they publish or share and you have to discover that from working with them and so that you really have to direct recording with them. that's that's the big takeaway on the local access licenses uh, and then the shared access licenses it's it's much more straightforward uh, and that there's no MNO to coordinate with, but there's still things you should be aware of that it's been a gotcha for a number of folks. So there's within that framework, there's you can operate with a medium power license or a low power license, and medium power allows you to cover a wider area, uh, but it's restricted to only rural areas. And what you might think is rural may not be what Ofcom thinks is rural. So there's been a number of folks we, we've worked with that given feedback, hey, we didn't know that this was actually urban. It doesn't Look, Urban, there's cows right there. Uh, and what they're doing is they actually have a GIS database that designates what's rural and what's urban. So they, they go to the computer, the computer says it's rural, it's, it's, it's rural, the computer says it's urban, it's urban. Um, but that's, uh, again, that's one of the features in the toolkit that was made here. You can get uh, immediate feedback if it's urban or rural. And they'll also check to make certain you have not screwed up anything uh, on your application in terms of uh, picking it out of band or um, uh, unallowed antenna height or, or antenna gain or features such as that. But uh, I'll, I'll let Kitty comment on, on firsthand experiences uh, interfacing with Ofcom. Yeah, so a, a number of the licenses that we've been using up in Orkney um, are run through what's called a test and development license. Now, this is a license you can use for building pilot networks, uh, but they are not suitable for use for running a commercial network. It's actually sort of written into the terms and conditions, so you can't use it for commercial. So we've been involved in the applications for uh, some local access licenses and some shared access licenses. And probably the main feedback I would say is it's a fairly drawn out process. You know, you, you fill in uh, the application form with the tool that Heritage Wireless have been developing, you send it off and, you know, it could be a, a fairly long period of time before you hear anything back. And uh, you get some surprise responses, should we say, from some of the operators about, uh, potential future deployment plans. Um, needless to say, uh, these, these spectrum access routes are kind of key to unlocking uh, the option for building 4G, 5G networks, because up until now, um, you know, unless you've got a, a strong relationship with an operator and you know, you're able to sort of borrow some spectrum or uh, sort of sublease some spectrum off them, there's no way that a rural community would be able to take part in these spectrum licenses, uh, spectrum auctions. The last uh, round of auctions, um, the total money raised was 1.36 billion pounds. And you know that's just completely out of the league of what a rural community would be able to buy into. So uh, the, the shared access license, the local access license are definitely steps in the right direction. Maybe some improvements to be made, but you know. The, the whole applying to Ofcom for a license and shared licenses is actually completely new to everyone. So this is not something that people have been doing for many, many years. It's really only in the last few years in, in the UK and a few other countries worldwide that the option for shared band access has been available. So uh, it's something that's, that's really new to everybody. And as part of uh, the 5G New Thinking project, we, we had some experience in previous projects. We're kind of trying out the system, testing the system. And it will evolve so that, uh, you know, the prospect of, of getting a license, maybe not for a month or a year or maybe just for a few minutes or that type of thing will happen in, uh, you know, in, in, in the near term, uh, you know, the next few years. So it, it's really new to us all. Uh, and it's also new because the technology is now there. It's now possible, you know, for someone to, to actually build their own uh, private network. And a few years ago, as Kenny points out, the cost and the equipment, it, it just wasn't really viable. Uh, but now it is, and that's why, you know, maybe a bit of a revolution brewing here about complementing the excellent networks we get from uh, mobile network operators. But th there's another way. You've got your, your unlicensed, your Wi-Fi. You've got your public network, we call it, from the mobile network operators. And here's another band. Here's a shared band that we can, we can do something with. But you have to be licensed. And if you're not licensed, well, you're breaking the law. And uh, you're maybe a jammer as well. You might be jamming someone nearby who is licensed because you're broadcasting in a, in a spectrum band that you should not be. So, you know, there's lots to evolve, but, but, but really exciting uh, you know, kind of new opportunities for us all. And can I uh, sort of pick up, there's a couple of different points I'd like to pick up from actually. The, um, you know, it seems to me like we do need to have a certain amount of, of kind of local knowledge uh, about spectrum use in our, uh, in, you know, if you're a community that was thinking about this, 
Yeah, that's one of those points, I guess, of information asymmetry that you've got to correct for if you're going to be able to do this. Would that be a, a, be a fair reflection, uh, Kenny? There are some open source data sets available of uh, what spectrum is used in particular areas. So, for example, um, the Tool Federated Wireless have built for the shared access license and local access license is pulling in some data from uh, a service called SiteFinder, which basically had a database of where um, radio masks were uh, sort of operating from. There's some open source tools such as Cell Mapper, where um, you know, people in the community install an app on their phone and just sort of go out and do their thing. And it records uh, the location of base stations, uploads that information to the cloud, and then that's sort of starting to build up a cloud data set. But definitely one of the things communities should probably be doing um, if you are thinking about uh, rolling out a 4G, 5G network is carrying out a spectrum surveys of some sort. So whether that's with spectrum analyzer equipment or it's um, with a, a sort of drive test, you know, going out with a, a set of measuring equipment and looking at which bands are in use by which operator, doing some of these tests very quickly allows you to say, right, that band's busy, that band's busy, that one's free, that's the one I'm going to focus on. And then that's what you should then pursue with the, the, license, the local access licensing approach. Excellent. And, and Jody, does that, um, does that also then feed into the, uh, the, 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 the tool that Federated have built for, uh, uh, for new thinking? Uh, yes, it does. So, um, as um, I'll also add that the, the MNOs publish uh, coverage data, and Ofcom also collects that too. So, that's, that's another data source that we use for, for the LAL. Um, and then for the SALs, uh, Ofcom uh, maintains all the SAL data uh, and then most of the incumbent data uh, in the wireless telegraphy uh, register, uh, except for uh, UK broadband deployments. And they also don't maintain the specific site information. Of, uh, for MNOs, uh, there is a security and privacy aspect to that, uh, and then there's also been folks who have been doing bad things to MNO sites, uh, which led them to to not want to make that data public. Um, so uh, Ofcom has the reasons for that, but um, that the lack of that data is, is one of the reasons that you sometimes have to go to uh, public sites like CellFinder or whatnot, which is imperfect because it's it's being crowdsourced from, from measurements and it's not. The operator saying, "I actually put a tower here." It's sometimes inferred and, and without um, actually having data. The, the tower really is there, and the cells are really being used for, for these bands. Interesting. Okay. Um, talking about operators, um, uh, you know, they, they, they obviously they, you know, they provide the services that that that, 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 that many, most, all of us uh, use in our our, our day to day uh, day to day lives, and, and they've made significant investments in. Uh, in those spectrum assets and licenses that they hold, and not, and not forgetting the, the networks themselves. Um, uh, Bob, perhaps you can talk us through maybe a bit of their their perspective. You know, what's um, you know, what are they what are they caring about when 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 these requests for uh, activity on their 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 bands uh, arrive? Um, yeah, what they what they care about. Well, I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's been it's been quite the evolution. I mean, five G is the fifth generation, and if we go all the way back to one G, where you know Ofcom were making spectrum available to, you know, the, the early mobile network operators, then two G and the three G, and we, we we keep evolving forward. So, uh, it's only really in the last few years, starting with what was called TV white space bands, that these shared bands have become available. And Jody called out what happened in 2019 with the shared access license and local access license. So the shared access license, the mobile network operators, well, they wouldn't be using that anyway. So they don't really have a strong you know, view on, on, on the use of licensing there. But for these local licenses, well, of course, they will have a, a very strong view because their objective is to, is to you know, build this kind of national public network that you know, is absolutely fit for purpose in urban and, and rural areas. So I guess I'll have to sit back and think in a, in, a, in a very remote rural area where there may be very few people per square kilometre so that there is no business model. There just isn't a business model. We could wait for intervention, which means the government will support and will you know, will, uh, will grant or, or, or fund to, to build some form of network in a very rural area. Uh, or maybe the third way is that the community says, look, we'd like to do something. So from that point of view, the mobile network operator has to understand that that's something 
uh, you know, might be of benefit to them in the future. Might be something they can integrate with, or there's lots of terms, you know, neutral host and other terms that we all use that they might be able to 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 build some form of future access that connects to their network. Because otherwise, you do one of these local access licenses using a piece of the MNO spectrum with the approval of Ofcom, with the approval of the mobile network operator. But if it becomes a little island, and and you know, you cannot enter from outside, you cannot leave then it doesn't quite have the, the, the purpose, perhaps, of, of being this wider, you know, national network type of, uh, of implementation. So I think the MNOs will be just looking to, to understand that uh, whatever is proposed and done, they can see in the future that this will just augment the connectivity, you know, for the UK, because they're not there usually for reason of very simple economics or there's an intervention happening like shared rural network for the government. It takes time to roll out and time can mean years uh, given there's so many locations. Therefore, I think they're, they're very responsive to the, you know, the intention and the objective of these kind of private networks. But we're all still just learning, okay, how could we then take that and, and somehow integrate it and make it more seamless uh, operation with, with, with the actual uh, network run by that MNO? Amazing. And let's let's pick up on the um, uh, on the SRN then, um, uh, if I may, because that uh, that that's obviously got a role to play in in, in solving uh, uh, prior generation challenges. Uh, how is that uh, how is that operating, and, and what 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 does that mean for for, for local communities? Uh, I'll, I'll say Bob first, and then we can move around. So, um, so shared rural network, uh, you know, the, the objective there is the government doing an intervention, the UK government doing an intervention to provide a certain level of funding in order to accelerate the rollout of, you know, mobile connectivity in, in, rural, in rural areas. So I, I guess it's going well. And, uh, but th the thing is, there's, there's been lots of interventions over many years from different groups, governments and, and, and so on. But uh, you will be in a queuing system. Uh, and, and there will be areas that are done before other places are, are, are actually going to be, uh, you know, to, to, be, to be set up. I don't know how they prioritise, and, uh, and I'm, I'm sure they do in some way. So we've always, uh, in, you know, in, in 5G New Thinking, we've just always thought of this third way. And the first way is just business as usual for, the, for this national network that, you know, there's just a business model and the, and the mobile network operators can do it. And that might come anyway because the cost of equipment is reducing and backhaul costs of, of getting from the mobile base station back to the, the internet, so to speak, that's all reducing. So that's the first way. And, and uh, you know, that will continue to roll out in various areas with, with cost changes. Then the intervention that we, we, we just mentioned, that's you know, really you know, support funding, grant funding, uh, incentive funding, whatever you might want to, to call it, that will help uh, financially for the MNOs to, you know, to share locations and to roll out and, and build the, the backhaul. But our third way is, look, uh, you know, not, not just while we're waiting, but look, maybe some of that intervention funding could be annexed by communities. And with a little bit of momentum in the communities, with some understanding, with some professional uh, advice and, and know-how coming from, from, you know, from different uh, organisations, then you know, maybe they can stimulate the growth of, uh, of, of, of a, a local network faster and, and, and link that to the shared rural network. And if I looked at that in a very simple way, perhaps some of this future intervention money could go to the community. And the community almost have a voucher to say, hey, we're, we're ready to, to, to do this quickly. And you know, all of these exciting things about access to land and local capability and facility try and manage that to accelerate. Otherwise it becomes something that uh, is pure, you know, contract transaction based. The SRN is going to come and we're going to put a, a, you know, a base station here and it's just business. Maybe with the community having access to some of that funding or vouchers, it could be accelerated because maybe they would help, uh, you know, bring that uh, connectivity by uh, making sites available, making, you know, nearby power available, you know, uh, you know, coalescing to find you know business opportunities uh, and so on. So, thank you all, um, Joe. If I could I'll come to you, um, obviously, Federated are uh, are, are uh, have, uh, have have come to the UK uh, uh, through through New Thinking. Um, what um, what 
can we learn from your experiences in in, in other markets, and particularly in the US, but um, anything internationally that where we could uh, we could learn about uh, uh, that, we, that we could learn from? Um. So yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll reference it back to, to, to the U.S. market. Then. Um, so shared spectrum and then doing what's called what's called dynamic spectrum access uh, has has long been a, a vision in, in many different um, countries around the world. Um, so Bob mentioned the, the white spaces, TV white spaces in the UK, and there were white space efforts in in the U.S. and in Africa and and places in Asia and so forth. Um, and they were all faced with what's called a bootstrapping problem, in which uh, you, you would have uh, the band, but you wouldn't necessarily have equipment to go and deploy it in these shared bands. And so one of the, the things that both the US CBRS uh, band uh, addressed and the cell bands in the UK are addressing, I think, is they made certain that there is equipment for, for these bands. Uh, so you can get N77 equipment for the 38 uh, when CBRS, you could originally get uh, N42 or Band 42, Band 43 uh, equipment uh, for 4G in the US. So that, that was a, a big thing. Um, there's um, also the problem with the shared access in, in general that it tends to be um, uh, a market maker problem in that where there is spectrum available, there tends not to be people. So that's not so, so much a problem here for, for uh, uh, 5G new thinking, we're focused on rural areas because lots of spectrum available in rural areas and, and less demand and, and uh, uh, easier to get hold of, hold of it there than it is uh, in, uh, in, in urban areas. Um, so, but that, that can also inhibit the, the growth of the equipment market uh, if there's not a large population to support it. Uh, so in, in the UK, I think it's balanced out fairly well. Um, you, uh, at the showcases last week, there were, there were talks from uh, AWS and others talking about wanting to, to help support the growth of private networks uh, in, in the UK, where AWS is supporting them in the US, but they view uh, um, shared access bands that the SALs as a viable approach to start deploying private networks in the UK as well. So I, I, I think that's, that's valuable that the UK has kind of found a a new and different model that that appears to be working well. There's there's um, so for for quick context and some numbers. There's there's about fourteen hundred SALs operating uh, in, in the UK right now. It's, it's about twenty LALs, uh, uh, local access licenses. So it's it's really been successful in terms of opening up the, the market. Uh, and it's still early. It should still grow. There's still things that can be tweaked to make it better. Uh, but but it looks like it's taking off and getting some minimums. As you're getting some some big commercial entities behind it to, to make it not just a theoretical construct, but a, a business supported uh, mechanism for, for getting access to spectrum and deploying private networks. Interesting, okay. Um, we're, uh, uh, I'd like to just uh, finish off by uh, uh, asking each of you uh, just to either give me your, your, your top, uh, top message for, about spectrum for, for, for communities, or if there's something that you'd like to, Convey that we haven't uh, haven't covered yet. Then, uh, then the floor is yours, uh, Kenny. I'll uh, I'll come to you first. That's right. Okay. So, Spectrum. You know, getting your head around Spectrum, as you sort of alluded to right at the start, Peter, it is a little bit of a challenging topic. We have tried to pull together a lot of very useful information in the toolkit, um, discussing you know, what Spectrum is, what the different bands are, what the different bands can be used for, the sort of approaches you need to go through for. Uh, you know, designing a network, the trade-offs of different spectrum bands, all that sort of thing. So try and read all that, try and understand that um, as a sort of first, a first stop. Could have said it better myself. It's literally my final line. Uh, 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 Bob, let me, uh, let me come to you. Yeah, I always like an analogy, uh, Peter. So if, if I go back to FM, which I think, you know, most people will have an understanding and I'm sitting in Glasgow, and if I go through the FM dial, I get Radio Clyde and Capital Radio and Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3, Radio 4. These are all in separate frequency bands, and I can give a number, which is a number of megahertz for that band. So, you know, for communities out there, in some ways, uh, you know, spectrum being available, well, well, so what? You know, why would I want to run an FM radio station uh, if, if it was FM that was available? But if we all start to think about that, well, if you run an FM radio station, 
perhaps you might be doing something different to just playing music and talk. You know, you might be using that to to communicate with uh, with traffic lights or to communicate with uh, you know other uh, households or some private network where people are all kind of working together. So as folks start to think in a in a different way, the prospect of having access to spectrum and understanding what you can do with it, you know, the market will absolutely grow. And uh, you know, even even just three years ago, you know, most people will, what would I do with spectrum? I and mean, I can't even get it. So what would I do with it? Well, now you can get it. So think about what you can do with it, uh, and think about what you can do with it for your private purposes. What could you do for your education, for your council, you know, for your, uh, you know, uh, your local industry, for your forestry or whatever it, it might be? And when you come up with those ideas, well, then look at the business model and decide if, if you would like to access Spectrum. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I agree. Helpful analogy. Um, thank you. Uh, Jody. Uh, final word for you. All right, uh, I'll, I'll make a few different points. So... Uh... First, I'll, I'll reiterate a theme that we kind of hit on today is that uh, shared spectrum uh, is a natural enabler for, for private networks. It, it gets around the, the problems of, of uh, indefinite coordination within the nodes and then not having uh, vast resources to go off and get licensed spectrum. And then it also provides better guarantees of service and protection from interference than an unlicensed system could, where you might have uh, everybody in your apartment building on Wi-Fi and stepping on top of each other in an uncoordinated fashion. Um, so shared spectrum is important, but well, whereas we've been uh, emphasizing the, uh, the value of going off and meeting on it, I would like the world to get to a point in which you didn't have to think about spectrum, that you could then go and focus on your business model and, and what, what is your network actually trying to do for your community. Um, so to the extent that the, the rules and access procedures can, can be written down and, and made very definite, and they can be turned into software and they can become something that just hides in the background that your, your machine uh, goes off and talks to to find where, where is it able to be operated and you don't have to really think about it. Where, where we run into problems in terms of making that happen is when it's not uh, well documented, it's not uh, a procedure to follow. So um, I, I mentioned the, the big disparity between shared access licenses and local access licenses. Uh, to illustrate this last point, um, for, for shared access license, Ofcom published the document says, these are the, the calculations we're gonna follow. And as you satisfy these, you get access. For local access licenses, it's go talk to the local m and if they say, okay, it's okay. But that's, I, I can't implement that in software. I can't make that something that goes and hides in the background. So as long as it's like that, it'll always be this long painful process where you actually do have to go and learn uh, about the details and, and you'll have to be smart on it so you can actually get, get use of, of something that, that should be easily available for everybody. Excellent. Thanks, Jody. Um, so uh, thank you all for, uh, for, for contributing to, to this and for the, the efforts uh, that you've made on the toolkit. Uh, I will echo Kenny's uh, 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 call out to, uh, to, 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 to uh, follow through with this, from this, uh, this chat and have a look at the uh, the toolkit uh, and the content that's there about spectrum and indeed uh, many of the other topics uh, that uh, the communities need to need, need to grasp um, uh, uh, I personally uh, I've actually I feel like I've 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 I've, I've overcome a barrier uh, in this conversation and, and actually now uh, no far no more and uh, understand more than I, than I did at the start which, uh, which, is, which is excellent um, so thank you very much uh, thank you all for watching uh, and uh,